special presentation. Every day, meteorologists measure, track, and forecast. They use radar, satellites. What does it mean to you? Stay tuned as we explain the process of bringing home the weather. For centuries, what we knew about our environment was simply what we could see and sense around us. Today's weather was easy enough to see. Tomorrow's weather in the hands of greater powers. Ben Franklin was one of the first to observe that storms travel across the surface of the Earth. That was in the 1700s. But not until the 1800s, the age of enterprise, would Mr. Franklin's observations be supported. The 19th century was a time of thinkers, tinkerers, a time when technology broke into all areas. And meteorologists drew their first weather maps. The maps gave the first clues as to the broad nature of weather systems. In the beginning, they were strictly research tools. This map was made using observations taken 3 p.m. August 11th, 1843, but it wasn't drawn until 1848. A map of the weather five years ago will not help with tomorrow's forecast. In order for these maps to be useful to a forecaster, someone had to find a way to collect current observations on a timely basis from a wide geographic area. That would take a modern communication network. So weather forecasting was born on the lines of the telegraph. In 1870, the Western Union Telegraph Company produced daily weather maps, charting temperature, wind direction, and cloud cover. That same year, because of a rising number of shipwrecks on the Great Lakes, President Ulysses S. Grant signed a resolution. It required the military to take meteorological observations and give warning to the approach of storms. In effect, a National Weather Service was started. It's been almost 120 years since President Grant's mandate for the taking of meteorological observations. I think he'd be quite pleased with the system we have in place today. We're here at the National Weather Service office in Athens, Georgia, housed in its local airport. It's one of 230 such offices around the country taking observations systematically throughout each and every day. Meteorologists like Greg Hansen record the hourly temperatures, the humidity. They check altimeters for the air pressure, eventually a visual state of the sky, the height of the cloud ceiling, any precipitation that has fallen, all of this information ends up in the hourly surface observations. The Weather Service codes and enters the information into a computer system which links Weather Service offices together. The computer transmits the message to the National Meteorological Center in Suitland, Maryland. Here, meteorologists plot those observations taken at the same time from all over the country. Now the process of making some sense out of all this data begins. One of the first steps in analyzing a map of observational data is to draw isobars on it. Iso meaning equal, bar for barometric, lines of equal barometric pressure. It's a lot like playing connecting the dots. The lines connect observations of equal barometric pressure. The pattern that emerges shows a kind of topographic map of the atmosphere. It shows peaks of high pressure and valleys of low pressure. On this map, the isobars encircle three areas of high pressure. But what is a high pressure system, and how does it form? Air masses get their physical properties from the land or water they are born over. If air sits over very cold terrain, it cools, compresses, sinks. It will pile up until acted upon by forces of nature. It starts to move. The air within a high-pressure system is not stagnant. Imagine we are riding a gust of wind down this mass of air. If the Earth did not rotate, then we would merely slide down the dome like water running down a hill. But our planet does rotate, so in the northern hemisphere where we live, our gust of wind is deflected to the right of the downward path. This is a law of nature known as the Coriolis effect. It causes the winds in a high-pressure system to rotate in a clockwise direction. Now, let's put our high-pressure system back on the map where we found it. The weather within the system is cold and clear, like this beautiful day in Denver. The three systems on our map have very different characteristics. 
The high in the southeast has picked up warm, moist air from the Gulf. The air mass to the north is cooler, but it has been weakened by a long trip across the continent. The boundaries where these three air masses collide are called fronts. If two air masses are of equal strength, then the boundary will be a stationary front, symbolized by a line with blue spikes and red rounded symbols. But on this particular day, the cold high was dominant, its pressure greater, so it developed a cold front. The blue spikes of the cold front indicate the direction it is moving. Cold air is moving in, pushing the warm air up. Meanwhile, the warm air mass is overtaking the cooler air to the north, resulting in a warm front. That's shown as a line with red rounded symbols facing the direction the front is moving. The warm air is riding up over the cooler air at the surface. At this point, the air circulation around the highs is developing a frontal wave, creating a low pressure center. The wind circulation in the developing low is the opposite of the highs. It rotates counterclockwise. As the storm front matures, the cold front is usually moving faster than the warm front and starts to override the warm air. This stage is known as an occluded front. It is shown by this purple line of alternating spikes and rounded symbols on the same side of the front. Now that we have a better feel for how highs form, how the battle between the air masses develops fronts and lows, let's see how it all works together. front wedges under the warm air and lifts it, forming clouds and precipitation. The steeper the lift, the more violent the weather. With the warm front, warm air replaces colder air on a more gradual slope. The clouds and precipitation may extend for hundreds of miles. Isobars, highs, lows, fronts, symbols on weather maps that you can see every day on TV. They can tell you a great deal about the weather now and what it will be in the future. When we come back, a bird's eye view from 22,000 miles away. The GOES satellites provide an essential input to our nation's weather forecasters. Without GOES, we would be lost. You grip the stick and hiss across the ice while frigid winds blast you full in the face. The sport is ice boating, and at speeds up to 60 miles an hour and temperatures down to 30 below, you don't take chances. You take Chapstick. Chapstick is heavy-duty lip balm, made for weather at its worst, made to go on smooth, to help lips stop chapping and start healing. Why trust your lips to anything less? Don't take chances. Take Chapstick. Hey, going for a swim? Yeah. No pool. Fine, I'll just work out in your gym. I have no gym. I was hungry anyway. Yeah, I was for a bite. Fine, yeah. No restaurant. Fine, that's it. I'm back in my room. No room service. Wake up! Who are you? You should have stayed at Holiday Inn. For a few bucks more, you'd have gotten everything you wanted, but no, you couldn't pass up a bargain. Fine. I'm just going to grab myself a bucket of ice water. Why take chances? Stay with someone you know. Holiday Inn. Eight past the hour. Thanks for joining us for bringing home the weather. A check on the current weather scenario will show you some light rain showers along the northwest coast. Otherwise, a setup of rain and fog from the southeast to the south central states. A little bit of snow and even some freezing rain, so be careful if you do have to do some traveling today. Now a look at your local weather. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for more of Bringing Home the Weather. Now, the 36-hour forecast. day forecast. Stay tuned for more of Bringing Home the Weather. 
The Weather Channel puts the Western States center stage during prime time. Watch the West Coast Edition every night from 8 to 11 Pacific Time on the Weather Channel.